Joseph, if I could go ahead and get you to pull that PowerPoint uh, presentation up for us. Welcome. We are glad that you are here this morning. We're going to have a little bit of issue with our Wi-Fi and our sound, so hopefully we can get those corrected. Uh, want to remember that uh, those who don't know, Kirk Swinney uh, has COVID again. And so he's home not feeling well. Jan stayed home to help him and obviously not to uh, take the risk of, of bringing it back to the uh, to this group of which you guys know I can spread it around. So we have, have started a pursuit of Jesus. We've been on a quest, uh, a 52-week quest and a year-long pursuit of Jesus, trying to find out who he is. We've seen who he is. We've seen his power. Uh, and now we're looking at his preaching. And if you've got your Bibles open up to Luke chapter 15, we're going to look at, a, at some of his lessons there today. But our quest for today, our question for today is, how does Jesus feel about prodigals? How does Jesus feel about prodigals? Today we're going to look at three of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told. And they're going to give us insight into what God is like. Going to give us insight into what Jesus is like. Remember that Jesus himself is God. And so this is how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, this is their personality. This is what they are like. And in these stories, Jesus is going to answer the question, how does God or how does Jesus feel about prodigals? Now, maybe you've heard that word prodigal before. If you've been a member of a church for very long or you've grown up in the church, or you've probably heard this story countless times. I'm not going to be covering any new ground here. But we need to know that this word prodigal means reckless and wastefully extravagant. The broader definition of the word prodigal means to be lost. It means being foolish, being rebellious. I think that's something that we probably all can identify with, being lost, being foolish, and being rebellious. And so we ask ourselves these questions. How does Jesus feel about the prodigal? Well, how does Jesus feel about us when we walk away? How does Jesus feel about us when we, when we wrecked our life with our own choices? How does Jesus feel about us when we've rebelled? How does Jesus feel about us when we're hiding or numbing or lying, or using, or cheating. How does Jesus feel about us when we're lost? And we find in these stories, I think, a very clear answer to how Jesus feels about us. Let's begin in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. It's a diverse group that's listening to Jesus. Tax collectors, they're just tax collectors were known to be cheats and 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 and, and ruthless at times. They were the enemy of the state, as it were. If you were a Jewish person, the tax collectors were your enemies. But if we look at Jesus, who did Jesus call to be one of his disciples, one of his apostles? He called Matthew a tax collector. So there must have been some good in the tax collectors. But then he says tax collectors and sinners. So that's, that's everybody else that Jesus has ever encountered, that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, which are here as well, don't associate with. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law have separated themselves. They think they're better than everybody else. We know the way to God, and we'll instruct you on the way to God. We know who God is. We know how he thinks. And so we will be the ones to direct you, the sinners, toward God. You know, the crazy thing is, when you look at Jesus throughout the Gospels, what you're going to find is that the people <laughs> that were nothing like Jesus really liked Jesus. And he, in turn, liked them. They had an affinity for him. He had an affinity for them. And they were all gathering around to hear what he had to say. And the religious leaders are muttering. 
Anybody ever been around a mutterer? Oh, uh, yeah, but can he do that? What's that guy doing here? We, that's what people used to say about me. Man, what's that guy doing here? Does he not know that the building's going to fall in on him? What? He's seeking out Jesus? <laughs> well, if anybody needs him, it's him. We all may have known mutterers. We all may have been mutterers. But Jesus continues, he says, he told them this parable, and he knows they're muttering. He knows what they're saying about him. He knows what they're saying about the others that are in the room. And he says this, he says, you know what, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. When Jesus is telling these stories, he's using situations that the people listening would have clearly understood. They lived in an agrarian society. They understood what shepherds were. They understood what sheep were. And Joseph, I did not pull up a video. I need you to look up a video for me real quick. It's on YouTube. It's about 34 seconds long. I may have pulled it up yesterday and left it down there. Yes, it's a sheep down there. That's it. That's it. We'll get to the, hold on, don't play it just yet. Just. Just leave that there. We'll get to it in just a minute. When a father would die, his estate would be divided among his two sons. So for the younger son to come to, oh, I'm, I'm, man, I'm a whole paragraph ahead. Wait a minute. Wow, where did I go? Do it, my page is in the right. Okay, there, okay. All right, anyway. They would understand what sheep were. They would understand what being a shepherd were. They, they would understand this analogy. I'm jumping way ahead of myself, but it's already up there. Sheep are not very bright animals. We're called sheep. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Hit the play button and make sure it's got the audio up as well because you're going to want to hear it. Uh. Isn't it great? Look at that. Yes. Say this better man. Search your phone. Hear the guy laughing? He's like, dumb sheep. That's that's it. Good. Thank you, Joseph. That's enough. They would understand what sheep were. They would understand a lost sheep. They would understand what it meant to go and get one. And then Jesus immediately goes into another illustration that they would understand. He says in verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house carefully, search until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together. And says, rejoice with me, I found my life's coin, lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We've all lost money around the house. We've all lost things around the house and tear the house up trying to find it. Something we could all understand. And then he goes into the most famous story. As Charles Dickens would say, this is the, the greatest short story ever written. He goes into the story of the parable, the parable of the lost son. Your version may say prodigal son. I think it should say lost sons. We're not going to get to the second son this morning, but we're going to look at the first one. And Jesus continued, he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. 
After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, verse 17, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You know, while Jesus is telling these stories, he's using illustrations that people would listen to. They would clearly understand these things. When you break this down in the Jewish culture, for a son to tell his father that he wants his inheritance, he would have to wait until his father was dead in order to receive it. In their society, the father, having two sons, would divide his property into threes. He would give two-thirds to the oldest son and one-third to the youngest son. But he would have to be upon their death. And did you know that in that society, if you were to shame your father by asking for your inheritance before he died, your father could then take you out of the city and stone you to death. At least that's what some of the reading I did this week said. The boy is saying to his father, I wish you were dead. You ever been so mad at your dad or your mom that you told them that? He brought shame to his family. In that culture, the, the, the leaders of the family were, were, the, were the patriarchs. They were, they were the elders of the town. They were the respected of the town. And it sounds like this father here has quite a bit of, 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 of money, of stature. Now, of course, I think we, when we look at this overall picture, we're going to see the father here is God. But in this particular parable, it's so, in situations they could understand, this father was affluent. And for his son to come up and say these things would have brought shame on him, would have brought shame on his family. He would no longer be able to hold his head up in the court. When the, when the elders of the town met at the city gates to discuss the business of the city, he would have to sit in the back if he were even allowed to be in there at all. He would be shunned by his own community. He may even be disrespected by his own wife. This was extremely, extremely humiliating for the father. The dad, the family, the whole community could disown this son for what he had done. He would have been completely ostracized, completely cut off. He would have been completely dead to them. And it says he goes and squanders his living, he squandered his wealth on wild living. You know, the first time when your life, when there are no parents around, what is it that most of us do? Man, my first, my first week at college, I'm three and a half hours away from home. I've never been more than three and a half minutes away from home. Three and a half hours away from home, nobody to tell you when to go to bed, nobody to tell you you have to go to class. Nobody to tell you you have to get up and you have to do your laundry and you have to keep your room clean. Nobody to tell you that you can't have alcohol. Nobody to tell you that you can't do what you want. Am I the only one? I, I, I didn't see anybody's hands go up. I, I'm assuming y'all are you know, ashamed or, well, that wasn't me. I hope it wasn't you. I really do. I hope it wasn't you. He's out there living a life, and he didn't count on spending everything, and he, he didn't count on wasting it all, and he certainly didn't count on there being a famine. And I think it's interesting when we read that, it says, he began to find himself in need. Because all the while doing what he was doing, he didn't seem to need anything there. All those things that he left home, Dad, I hope you're dead. I want my money, those things I need. I need my freedom. I need to go out and live my own life. And I need to run around and I need to squander it on, 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 on wine, women, and song. And I need to, to just live the high life. And I need to live my own life and be me. That's what I need. But the text tells us 
when he found himself in true need, there was nobody around. His friends had deserted him. You know, you ever have those have some of those kinds of friends, those fair weather friends? As long as you got money in your pocket, they're your best buddies. They'll help you eat barbecue and drink beer and all that other good stuff. They'll help you buy new cars and, and run them up and down the strip. They'll help you chase whatever you want to chase. But the minute your pockets are empty, man, I just can't make it. Got to see you. Take care of yourself. Those things he thought he needed were frivolous. When he found that what he needed was gone, verse says he came to his senses. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, how many of us have been there? And what would led up to him thinking that you know, he, he, he had come to his senses? Look at his job. What does Jesus say that his job is? He's swapping the hogs. Now, I don't know how many of you were raised on a farm. I was. I had the great opportunity to, to be around my uncles and my grandparents and, and work on their farm. I, I was actually raised on a farm that did not belong to me. We didn't have pigs, but we had cows and we had uh, chickens and some other things that were part of my responsibility to take care of. But my grandpa had pigs. Had them not too far from the house, but not so close that you could smell them. Because if you know anything about pigs... They stink. And they wallow around in mud that sours and smells bad. And then they themselves sour and smell bad. And for a Jewish person, what was, what was the one thing on their dietary list that they could not absolutely ever have? Pig. And where's his job? I'm there with the pigs. And he's so hungry. I don't know if you guys know anything about hog slop. It's nastier than the pig is. It's whatever was left over from the garden, mixed in with whatever soured milk that grandma had, mixed in with whatever, and you put it in a big bucket and you took it down to the trough and you made sure there was some kind of grain or something in there so they got some nutrition. And the hogs would just tear each other up to get to that trough. Matter of fact, we had to have three separate pens for my grandfather's hogs so that we could slop each one individually so that they wouldn't get into a fight and hurt one another. That was nasty. And he looks down at that slop and in his hunger he says, man, I bet that's pretty good. Now, I've never looked at a Brussels sprout that way. I've never been so hungry that a Brussels sprout appealed to me. Even if you were to, you know, slather it with cheese or chocolate even. Can you imagine being so hungry that hog slop looks good? And in that moment, verse 17 says, he came to his senses and he thought, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, it's important what he says to him. It's important that we talked about that redemption. It's important that the son conveys to the father exactly what the father needs to hear. Whether he actually believes this or not, he needs to say something to get the father's attention. I need some kind of hook. Father, I have sinned against heaven. If his father is a devout man, if his father is a religious man, if his father is a good Jewish person who tries to follow the, the laws and tries to follow those things, that appeals to the father. I've sinned against heaven. And Father, more than that, I've sinned against you. 
I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. So he got up and went to his father. <laughs> but while he was a still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You know, that's a pretty good speech, isn't it? I practiced a couple of those speeches. I wasn't really sorry for what I had done. I'm just sorry. I'm regretting the situation I find myself in. And I know if I want to get out of that situation, I need to put a certain order of words together to be impressive. I don't know if that's the man's heart or not. But that's part of the story. And that's how I see it. He'll say to his father, I know I'm dead to you. I know I'm cut off, but please just hire me as one of your servants because I'm starving to death because I'm so hungry and I know your servants eat. Just, I don't deserve being your son. Kind of using reverse psychology on his dad. At least that's how I see it. I, I hope that's not how it is, but that's, that's kind of how I read it. Just let me be a, a servant. So he runs to greet him. His father's coming out, and, his, and the son says to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Before the dad can say anything, he gets those words out of his mouth. But the father said to his servants, Quick. And the son's got to be going, What's he going to say next? Bring me the chopping axe. Bring me the sword. Bring me the whatever. He says, quick, bring me the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Young man beaten down by the mistakes he's made, torn clothing, dirty. Smells like sour mud, pig slop. Tangled and mangled hair and beard. A real mess. And reluctantly, yet resolutely, walking toward his father's house. A man that he had wished death upon. And as he looks up, he sees his father running toward him. Time to pull that speech out of the back pocket because I'm trembling and I don't know what to say. And if I don't say this real quick, Dad, because I don't know if he's going to kill me, I just want to get a chance to say this out loud before you kill me. And his father says, hush. None of that matters. In their culture, that mattered. In their culture, the son would have had to come drag him if he were even allowed in the city. The, the people, remember, he was excommunicated. He was dead to them. If he had shown up in that town, the people, the community, could have gotten together and taken him outside and killed him. And, and nobody would have blamed them. They would have been, that would have been a righteous act because of what he had done to his father. And so his father, at least in my mind, trying to spare his son the, the, the extended shame, runs to him. I will beat my neighbors there. But more than that, I want my son to know I still love you. I have always loved you. And that will never change. The father had been waiting not waiting to dole out punishment, not waiting to execute his dead son, but waiting, not waiting to humiliate his son as his son had humiliated him. He was waiting, longing and desiring, searching for his son to come home. Between the hugs and the kisses, the son tries to get his speech out. The father's going to have done of it. And through all of the embarrassment, through all the shame, through the hurt and the sorrow, the father's heart bursts forth and he restores the son. He gives him a robe, he gives him a ring, he gives him sandals. All of that are symbols of being reinstated as a son. You're back in the family. He says, I'm not hiring you as a servant. You are my child. I don't care where you've been, what you've been doing. 
You are my son. You're back and we're going to celebrate. And Jesus is telling this diverse group of people, this is what God is like. This is how I feel about prodigals. This is why I welcome sinners, and this is why I eat with them. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of God. And that's why we call it good news. Our story doesn't end there, but again, we're limited on time. I'm way overdue now. We're going to rush through these next three points very quickly. I see three things at play here throughout all three of these stories. When we ask the question, how does God feel about prodigals? First thing is he searches for them. The shepherd searched for the sheep. The woman searched for her coin. Did you know that in their society, when a woman would be married, she would get 10 coins, usually 10 silver coins. And so when Jesus uses that illustration about 10 coins, he's saying her wedding gift, this thing that is very sentimental, this thing that is very valuable to you, this thing that, that means the world to you, because this is, the, this is a gift from your earthly father to you. This is yours to spend on you. This isn't for your family. This isn't for your new husband. This isn't for anything. This is my gift to you. And she had lost part of it. And she searched for it. When he searched for the 99, some of us would say, well, he's got, you know, searched for the one. He's got 99 more. Well, the problem with that is it's like beers on the wall. 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Then you take one down, pass around, you got 98. And then 97. And then pretty soon you're down to zero. If you let that one sheep and you don't go search for that one sheep soon enough, you'll lose them all. And when we see the father standing on the porch, searching the skyline, looking out, he's not actively sitting on the porch. Oh, well, well, look who decided to show up. Business has gone on as usual. But the father is standing there searching the horizon. Will today be the day my son comes home? The second thing that we see about Jesus and prodigals is he rejoices when they are found. What did the shepherd do? He called his friends and neighbors together and said, let's celebrate, let's rejoice, because what was lost is now found. When the woman found the coin, she calls her friends and her neighbors. She says, what was lost, one, what was once lost is now found. Let's rejoice, let's celebrate. What does the father do? He puts the clothes on the son, and then he says, let's kill the fattened calf. We're going to celebrate at the end of verse 24. He rejoices when the prodigal is found. And there's something that is lost and had been lost on me until I read this this week. How does Jesus feel about the prodigal? He claims them as his own. Look at this. He says, my sheep, my coin, my son. He claims them as his own. He claims them for his own. With Jesus, there's no wall that he won't kick down. There's no lie that he won't tear down. We sang that this morning. And it's true because God thinks you're valuable. He's coming after you because you matter. Because you are important. Now, I know a lot of us have trouble believing that. We don't feel worthy. We kind of feel like a clearance rack material. We've all been to Walmart, and it's marked down six or seven times. It was originally 1999. It's down to you know 99 cents. Slightly irregular, maybe not the most stylish thing. Maybe some of us feel like we've been marked down over the years. Maybe it's because of something you've done. Maybe it's a, a DUI. Maybe it's a, a, an affair. Maybe it's a failed marriage. Maybe it's a financial collapse. Maybe it's because you flunked out of school or you got kicked out of the house. Or maybe it's an addiction. Or maybe it's your sexual experiences. Or maybe it's the words that you can't take back and get back. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you just don't feel worth 
anything to anyone, especially God. But God says, there's nothing further from the truth. When you're feeling inconsequential, insignificant, or inadequate, God says, you are so valuable. I will search for you. I will rejoice when I find you. And you are mine. We're going to see Jesus over and over again. We're going to see him like this father. The father didn't rush to his son and go, whoa, 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 just a minute now. I may have made a mistake here. You really stink. You need to go take a shower and then we can talk. Father grabs him and hugs him and kisses him, kisses him on the cheek. My wife won't kiss me when I come in from mowing the yard. When we see Jesus, when we see God, that's what we see him doing. He doesn't ask us to get all cleaned up and get some things taken care of and, and, and try to get things right before we come to him. He says, come home. I'll take care of the rest of it. We're going to see Jesus with a rough crowd. We're going to see him making friends with the down and out. We're going to see him with lepers, touching people that nobody else would. We're going to see him bring dignity to those who have none. We'll, we'll see him embrace little children. We'll see him, how he values women. We'll see that he takes an un, uh, ed, excuse me, ordinary, uneducated men and turns them into his inner circle of world changers. We'll see him down in the dirt with a woman about to be stoned. We'll see him cross racial divides intentionally. We'll see him criticized by religious leaders for those he invites over for supper again and again and again. The prostitutes, the cheaters, the sinners, the people with issues and illnesses and reputation, and every time you see him do that, you'll see him love them. And you'll see him accept them. And you'll see him welcome them into the kingdom. I'm grateful for that because, truth be told, I'm messy. Well, I clean up pretty good. But inside in my heart, I'm messy. Jesus is going to meet me where I'm at. Hey, he's not going to leave me there. But that's where he's going to meet me. When we ask that question, how does Jesus feel about prodigals? That's what he came for. That's what he lives for and that's what he longs for. Jesus came to call the prodigals home. Call them home. That's how Jesus feels about prodigals. Each and every one of us are prodigals. We didn't get to talk about the second son. He's the one who stayed home and did everything right. He's the one who followed the rules. He's the one who was the good son. And yet he was just as lost as his brother. So whether you are in the pig pen or whether you're in the penthouse, Jesus says, come home. Mike has a song for us that we're going to sing. Let's be standing as we sing. Calling, calling the prodigals come without delay. Hear, oh, hear him calling, calling now for.
um, 